<laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Christina. This is Cami Lutz. Welcome to my first ever live stream and collaboration. We are, which we just got done handling a ton of technical difficulties, which was guaranteed because technology hates me. Sorry. So <laughs> we're going to be talking about our uh, our personal favorite top ten best romantic subplot tropes in sci-fi and fantasy. And this may be a shock to people who have watched my channel for a while because I have notoriously bitched about romantic subplots <laughs> forever, but can be good when they're written well. And we're also gonna talk about how authors can get them wrong. But for now, I'd like to introduce my companion, Cami Lutz. Uh, she's a fantasy and sci-fi author and poet. Cami, welcome to the channel. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Cami with Flash University. Yeah, you see my cute little, oh, other way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my little uh, self promo right there. Um, I write all kinds of things. I just write. Um, I've written all forms. I love small form, large form fiction, and I do poetry and fantasy and science fiction. And nice. I've been writing since I could pretty much pick up a pencil. I just like it. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, same boat. Uh, for those of you who are curious, after this live stream, I did do. Well, I do have a link to Cami's Flash University channel in the description, so check that out. Especially since in two days' time, we are going to be having a live stream on her channel, talking about the top ten worst romantic subplot tropes and how authors can get them <laughs> right. Yeah, it's going to be a blast. I cannot wait. Uh, yeah. So, without further ado. Let's dive right in. Number one, see if I can do this right. Yes, the healthy romantic relationships. Cami, what is with the toxic relationships? I have no idea, but it is so big. And it has been big for a while now to have really toxic relationships. You know, if I had to guess, I would say that people are trying to create obstacles for the romance. And obstacles do not have to be dysfunctional relationships, you guys. <laughs> they and the can be a slew like, of things. And they'll have these dysfunctional relationships, but they'll they won't put them, they'll put them as relationship goals. Like the relationship at the end is just as toxic as it was yeah. at the beginning. Like if mm -hmm. if there was an arc in there, I'd love mm -hmm. that. Yes. But yeah, okay, that that's for our worst tropes video. Yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. Uh, we got to save some steam. Um, but yeah, so like healthy, sweet relationship, especially if it's like, I don't know about you, but you know, when I'm reading something like a grim dark or uh, a story that's just like a ton of characters are dying and there's just like a ton of bad stuff going along and just having this like one cute little romantic relationship between our lead and whatever whoever else is just like it's balm on a wound it's so mm. nice like there's everything else is going wrong but this one thing is going okay and i really like it when that happens uh, maybe i'm just a sucker no 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 it's kind of like comic relief but the romance version mm -hmm. of that yeah and really. i want to stress you like it it doesn't have to be a perfect relationship like it can even end in a breakup yeah. i've seen some really well written like a uh, rick raridan who I'm going to be mentioning a lot on this video, probably. Um, you know, he he had several romantic subplots going on in his Percy Jackson Heroes of Olympus series. And then mm -hmm. we found out that some of them, at least one of them, broke up in, in mm -hmm. the last series. But they're still friends. It's still mm -hmm. a healthy, functional relationship that they got going on. And, and that's great. Yeah. So I do want to say, <laughs> I do want to say it's it's really almost near impossible to write a healthy relationship if you don't know what a healthy relationship is. Yeah. So I would recommend if, if, cause we're so used to reading dysfunctional, I would recommend mm -hmm. just looking into different attachment styles, uh, different love languages. And um, when you look into that kind of psychology, what you get is how people can interact with each other in a healthy way. So knowing your partner's love language is important because if you you keep giving them gifts and that's not their love language, they're not going to be receiving love. So just know? to clarify what a love language is, like there, I think there's like five or something like that, yes. different ways that people express love. One, as you mentioned, is giving gifts. Mm -hmm. I like making gifts, like I'll knit uh -huh. and crochet presents for my friends and my family. Mm -hmm. um, another is like just like communication, talking, like verbal. Yeah. 
or something like that. Uh, it's been a while since I saw the, the Facebook post. <laughs> yeah. So um, there's, there's um, giving gifts. There's uh -huh. words of affirmation, which means like compliments and things like that. There's service, acts of service. Um, there is uh, touch, which is big for men, but is actually my second. It's really big for me. And then quality time is another one. Mm. Um, so yeah. those are those busy are love languages. Yeah. And then some people's, so an attachment style is how you, how you connect with another person. A love language is how you show that love, but an attachment style is how you, how you attach yeah. to them. So some of them are healthy and some of them are not. So if you want to write a healthy relationship, know what a healthy attachment style looks like. So that's my recommendation. I think so authors I sometimes don't know that they're writing on healthy relationships. So that could be a way that authors can get it wrong. Like if they're trying to write a healthy relationship without toxicity, but they don't understand love language and that these two people are actually communicating in totally different ways. Um, my, my thing that I put down was uh, just no chemistry. Like, like with those latest super Superman films where there's like, yeah, it's a healthy relationship that he's got going on with Lois Lane, but these two actors and these two characters just have no chemistry. <laughs> that's funny. I did not catch that. To me, I felt like they did. So that's, it's it's funny how we all see something a little different. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> all right. Uh, number two, what we got is power couple. I love me mm -hmm. some power couples. Um, so mm -hmm. for those of you who don't know, and I mentioned this um, on one of my earlier videos about, I think, favorite female character tropes or something like that. Uh, I don't know. Um, basically what a power couple is, is you have like two different people and they're both powerful in their own ways so like say mm -hmm. in a fantasy setting you've got a wizard and uh, a soldier or like mm -hmm. a king and a queen or something like that but then they they get together they hook up romantically and they're working together and they're like a powerhouse mm -hmm. and it's just so cool <laughs> i you know i don't even remember the last book i read that had a power couple i've read sarah some where it was close <laughs> what sarah j moss had one that's true. She has lots. That's true. She does love. She does love her power couples. That's true. Yeah, um, doesn't like Sarah J. Moss all that much. I'm kind of indifferent to her. I I like her actually. Really? Yes. <laughs> you were saying when we were doing our technical difficulties. Yes, I know. I know. I have things about her as a writer that I love, and things about her as a writer that I'm like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> yeah, no, her name will come up in the worst romantic subplots. I love <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, But yeah, no, I, like a historical example, and this I guess would be more of a villain power couple, but, um, and we'll talk to that about that later, but I'm um, like Isabel and Ferdinand of Spain. Like they were both extraordinarily formidable and powerful themselves, but then like, they married and they created Spain. <laughs> like, yeah. that's, that's just so cool. Uh, again, uh, Percy Jackson and Annabeth Chase uh, in the Rick Riordan series, like we, we see like the, the first, entire first series is, is set establishing, five books is set establishing um, these characters separately. Like, you know, Percy is the son of Poseidon. He can control the ocean and talk to, you know, the, the sea life and the horses and he's like you know impulsive and headstrong but you know got a good heart great hero and then annabeth daughter of athena is like mm -hmm. the smartest person in their camp so when they get together romantically like they're you just you just can't stop them <laughs> it's, yes it's great i love seeing that um have you ever seen um wicked on broadway the no play? i need to i need Talk to about a power couple it really was one power couple to another. Mm. I don't know if I'm oh, spoiling it for somebody, but um, no, he, I mean, he's, he's in a relationship with mm -hmm. um, Glenda mm -hmm. and then he is in a relationship with Alphaba, oh, uh, which is okay. the Wicked Witch. And so he goes from the one coupling to the other, but they're both power couples. So he's got a they're, type. <laughs> uh, they're actually opposites. Huh? They're both witches, but they're actually totally oh, but female opposite. Female power, powerful women witches. Yeah. <laughs> that's a like type. Those. You would actually really like that show, I think. Because it came it out when really I was like 12. So and, it, it came out when I was yeah. something like 12 or 13, and my parents were just like, yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> by the time yeah. it stopped being big, I was like, like yeah. Oh, I don't think it'll ever stop being big. Okay, that's well. my only slightly biased opinion. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, have yeah. you ever seen power couples be written poorly 
or like how an author has, has messed them up. Yeah, I've seen it where, um, and I can't even think of a specific example, but I've seen it mm -hmm. where when they get together, um, are either there's a clashing where they don't meld perfectly. It's almost like they should be in separate books mm -hmm. or where one becomes the dominant figure. Yeah, and, and it's usually the guy. They don't each yeah. remain powerful. Yes, yeah, it's they, usually they the guy. phase out one of them, and it's usually the woman that they that they phase out that they make that they tone down to show off how great the the dude is. <laughs> yeah, essentially, yeah. <laughs> uh, I hate it when that happens. It uh, makes me cry. It makes me cry very, very, very hard. I want them to be equal. Yeah, it's the whole point of whatever. No <laughs> um, holiday. Okay, this is what we like. <laughs> now, this is our likes. <laughs> no, it's like, and when I'm writing, I write what I like. And like, I usually don't write romantic subplots because I usually don't like them. But when I do, it's almost always a power couple because mm -hmm. I love, you know, powerful women characters. And I love, you know, dude heroes who are like, you know, their they're best friends and, and who stand with them. So like, and have complimentary skills. Like they, they literally can't do the task without the other. And it drives yeah. me nuts when they don't do that. <laughs> Uh, yes. Speaking of which, number three, uh, opposites attract. They usually do become power couples. Do. Or at least a lot of power couples are opposite. Like, yeah. you know, I mentioned the the wizard and the soldier as one, or like you'll have a, a politician. Like, I really want to see something like, you know, a princess, like almost stereotypical, archetypal princess, but like she's politically savvy and like just like able to manipulate and like, you know, get stuff done. Like basically a Daenerys Targaryen when she was written well. Um, mm -hmm. And then like her bodyguard or, you know, the a, a warrior prince or something like that. That is what I want to see. So any of you watching in the comments, if you know what that is, <laughs> tell me in the comments. That's the whole Actually, reason I love this channel. <laughs> you pretty much just described my work in progress. So I'll have oh, to let really? you know. <laughs> yeah. <Yay! I> <laughs> hey. Yes. She is, um, she is very, very good with words, and she's mm. not so good with the sword. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but she's yeah. faking her way through the army, faking <laughs> her way through the army. So yeah, that's a sneak peek, you guys. I kind of, I kind of let the cat in the bag. But, but yeah, so. I can't think of a worse place for her. That's genius. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if you need a critique partner, let me know. I, I am all ears on that one. I'm going to remember that. <laughs> um, okay, I also put under opposites like uh, a Cinderella story or a clashes, a classes clash. So mm -hmm. like something like, you know, not the the rich person, usually guy swooping in and rescuing the, the, the poor girl, but like, you know, just seeing people from from different, totally different backgrounds. Like, you know, you've got someone who was born with a, a silver spoon in their mouth, but like has to be super wary about, you know, friends and people who will try to use and abuse them for their money versus mm -hmm. someone who has to work three jobs from the time they were 16 just to put food on the table. So like, I, I really like seeing that and seeing how they, how they mesh, how they work together, how they come to understand one another and eventually fall in love. Yes. Yes. I a story that comes to mind, and I can't remember the author. If you guys watching can think of the name of the author, let me know. Um, but Cinder, I don't know if you ever read Cinder. It's a retelling. I've of heard Cinder. of it. I love the way, and I almost mentioned it as a power couple because um, oh, because she is just so powerful in her own right. Mm. So yes, he is the prince, and it's the typical princess thing, or the the prince and the popper right. theme. Um, but she, she is just a powerhouse and she is just like, I'm not putting up with it. You know, <laughs> like I, just, I love, I love the way that she did this and I, it's driving me mm -hmm. crazy. I can't think of her name right now, but yeah, no, I'm, you'll remember it as soon as we finish with this live probably, stream. <laughs> probably later I'll be laying in bed and embarrassed because mm -hmm. she's a best selling well, author. <laughs> well, and it's interesting how you mentioned like with, with the power and I should have mentioned this with, with the power couple before, but like. Normally, when someone thinks powerful women, it's like, uh, um, like they think power in the terms of the masculine sense, mm -hmm. like being able to fight, being able to dominate and, and control. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, don't get me wrong. I love it when, you know, 
when when my women characters do it, when my guy characters do it, especially if it's like against the bad guys, <laughs> like that's great. But like, there's a certain like like I feel feminine strengths aren't are really kind of being shoved aside to make way for the the strong female character. Yeah, and it's just like that, that's such a shame. And it's like I'll and I'll be the first mm -hmm. to say I am not a feminine girl. <laughs> I'm I'm not. I I only wear dresses to like super important fancy occasions. I never wear makeup. Like that's just not my thing. It's not my aesthetic. But I respect the hell out of the girls who do. So mm. like I I, I don't. Know, I kind of want to see more of that and see more of the different types of power and how an opposites couple would utilize different types of power to solve different problems. Yeah, and it's called the the badass uh, <laughs> the badass character. And yeah. I really think that they've done women a disservice when they yeah. focus too, too often mm -hmm. on that. You know, yeah. it's not that it's bad or that we can't read it. It's it's when it's oversaturated like it yeah. is right now, that's when it becomes a disservice. I will say that was a, that was a great strength. It's why I really love like girl gangs and multiple women in the same story because you'll a lot of times you'll see yeah you have the badass strong female character the, the one with the sword and all stuff and then you have something like the princess or the diplomat you got the tinkerer you've got the bookworm you've got all these different types of women utilizing their different strengths and like the same way that a, a guy gang can can do that so yeah. that yeah I, we need more of that <laughs> back to the topic at hand <laughs> um when have you seen uh, an opposites attract gone wrong? Jeez, I feel put on the spot right now. Uh, <laughs> I should have prepared better for this. Yes, like uh, you didn't study. Come on. Ah, I really feel like I'm being quizzed. Like I really should have studied harder for this <laughs> test. Uh, an opposites attract done wrong. Yeah, um, for me, for me, like it's when they're they're too opposite. Like they have absolutely yeah. nothing in common and they're they're contrasting instead of complementing. Yeah, that, I would say when it's dysfunctional. That too. So maybe <laughs> maybe for me it's not that the contrast mm -hmm. is too large, but that um but the the coming together isn't complete. Mm -hmm. Or the too much of a power imbalance, especially with a Cinderella story type of thing. Like, I mean, Prince and Popper, I mean, it's a cute story, but at the same time you gotta ask yourself like what happens when the prince or, or princess orders them to bed and they don't want to like what what do you do how it's i mean unless it's like explicitly like you got a scene on that where the the power person in question is like makes it perfectly clear that the person the other person that has some power in this relationship like that yeah. has a lot of icky connotations <laughs> that just automatically gets my back up yes so um power dynamics are something that aren't as familiar with people who have always been in a position where they've had a little bit of power mm -hmm. so i'm talking diversity here yeah um, there's a there's a a power dynamic like this when you get into yeah um, yeah some some other White culture privilege, some other male privilege people. yes and so I actually studied the sign language interpreting mm -hmm. and so I studied white privilege a lot and I studied male privilege a lot I studied mm -hmm. a lot of it and um, what I <laughs> what I've come to find is that people don't even if you don't spend time in your life thinking about power dynamics that mm -hmm. means you have it. That's yeah. what somebody told me. And I was like, that's a, that's, a that's, that's fair. Yeah. And I'm going to jump ahead to the, uh, our next trope, which is yeah. diverse couples. Um, oh. and, 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 and you're right. It's like, and it, there's nothing against privilege. I mean, we're both, we both have white privilege. We both have those, those blinders on. So unless it's like shoved in our face, like racism is shoved in our face and like explicitly explained to us is like, wow, I didn't even know that that, was a problem that I was yeah. complicit in. Like, okay. Yeah. And then the true test of character, I think, is how do you react to that? Yeah. Um, and then how do you react to that in a in a romantic sense? If it's if you're in a if you're from a, a privileged place and your partner isn't at like mm -hmm. most couples, <laughs> um, yeah. or or even like, you know, dating someone of color, how does that look? Yeah. Yeah, so I've actually seen deaf people be um, discriminated against 
uh, in very illegal ways, very mm -hmm. illegal ways, by professionals, by um, religious leaders, by all kinds of stuff. And so it's just something that that um, you really got to look into to notice if you're doing it wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. Me personally, I come from an interracial family. Mm. Um, growing up, I was all vanilla. Uh, my whole family was vanilla until both of my parents, after getting divorced, remarried interracially. So mm. I actually have the benefit of being able to see interracial couples. And my stepdad, shout out, he's a poetry writer, and he just got put on Reddit, and he's going to be on the news. Oh, I'm so yeah. happy for him. He, he's 20 years older than my mom, and he met uh, Dr. Martin Luther King when he was little. And yes. yeah, and really? so he gets to, yeah, how cool is that? So he gets <laughs> to be on the news and talk about meeting Martin Luther King. And I'm just, I'm just so proud, tickled mm -hmm. pink. Um, but I got to see those age differences because there's mm -hmm. such a gap and then those cultural differences and then those race mm -hmm. differences and background differences. And um, so when you write a book, it's really important to know what those differences are because yeah. they will come up in the story. Yeah. And if they don't come up in the story, you're doing the story a disservice. Yeah. Even if, like a, a, even if it's like an epic fantasy or far flung futuristic sci-fi, like, I mean, it doesn't have to be our specific American mm -hmm racial or racial dynamic that we got going on but like it you you got stereotypes and like like i think this was a problem that george r. r martin ran into which was like you know all of well not so much adorned but the show um all of the the civilizations that were run by people of color were either slave states or barbarians and it was like, and Dorn was the one that was supposed to be the most progressive. Like they, they valued their women. They kept their children out of war to the best of their ability. And then the show just botched it. <laughs> and it oh my, uh, uh, my brother is actually commenting here. He is um, studying psychology and he, he made a cool, cool note here. Like uh, our brain does a lot to keep us safely racist because it takes a lot more cognitive effort to change who you are as a person rather than just hide the fact that you have problematic beliefs. I would love to see that explored more often as in sci-fi and fantasy, especially if it's like you got, you know, a, a, a person who is, um, you know, from one racially or, or just generally privileged group trying to date or seduce another and like the person who's there they're just like mm, like i like you as a person but you're giving off some really not good vibes right now and having that character arc take place that would be kind of cool um i also love to see more same-sex couples and lgbtq plus representation for a variety of reasons one i am aromantic asexual so um for those who don't know, that means I do not experience romantic attraction, nor do I experience sexual attraction. And they're two very different entities. And I get that the the Aero label probably is not applicable to a romantic relationship. So like that one's fine. But like in all the books I've read, I've only seen ever, ever seen two explicitly stated ace characters. Mm. And that was in, like in the Diviner series by Libba Bray and who is in a romantic relationship. And an Arrow Ace character from, God, what was it? Um, Deathless Divide was the sequel. Dread Nation by Justina Ireland. Um, mm. Zombies in the Civil War. Mm. Um, and it's like, uh, we, I, am, I am so much more forgiving of a romantic subplot if the two characters are gay. <laughs> I really am. <laughs> it's, it's, like a, it's the heteronorm, heteronorm I can't talk today, and now my my viewers are seeing how much I edit out of these videos. The <laughs> just like, uh, like, like I get that that is the majority, but like it is in like is like ninety nine percent of the media we consume. Uh, can we get that down to like seventy five, <laughs> roughly? So um, I know there are lots of resources for <laughs> learning about LGBTQ so that you can write that appropriately. But where do we go for learning about ACEs and things like that? Like, what is your recommendation? So my recommendation, um, and this is like for anyone who not just writers, but like something like Facebook groups and Reddit, because you're if you like join that and they exist, like they I am a part of a ton of 
aromantic and asexual support groups on Facebook. There's even one about Aero Ace writers specifically that I'm a part of. And you'll see like talking with and, and talking to and asking questions in these groups, you'll meet like hundreds of people who are willing to answer and like willing to say, oh yeah, no, here's the difference between asexual and sex repulsed and sex positive and, you know, the gray sexuality, demisexuality and like all this stuff. Um, so basically talking to real people about it online and in person. And if you're an author and you want to add uh, Aero or Ace or Demi um, representation in your story, first of all, thank you, especially if it's sci-fi or fantasy. Um, and second of all, you know, ev every author should have like critique partners and beta readers where they give their manuscript to other people to, to get their two cents. Um, talk to Aero Ace people, ask them to, if they're willing to, to read this and they will tell you if you're doing it right or if you're doing it wrong um and that's really that's really the best way to do it in my opinion that's how i do it when i'm uh trying to represent a, a, my, a minority group in my writing that i am not a part of uh mm -hmm. and first of all you learn a lot uh it's really fascinating just so cool the things that you learn and yeah. then the other thing is like it your writing will greatly improve you'll, yeah. you'll get the characters done right yeah, so something that I'm going to be starting on my channel, little shout mm -hmm. out, is um, a series called A Day in the Life. And I'm actually going to interview people from various um, nationalities, jobs, uh, minorities, things like that, so that um, authors have a resource to go to when they're like, mm -hmm. I don't know what a day in the life looks like for a Muslim American. Yeah. I don't know what a day in the life looks like for a deaf American. I don't know, mm -hmm. things like that, so that they can be like, oh, this is... This kind of with the struggles that they go through. Okay, I can write mm -hmm. that, you know, because they say write what you know. And if you've if you've never been through it, if you don't know somebody who's been through it, um, if you've never talked to somebody who's been through it, you just you don't know what you don't yeah. know. And that's a lot of times why discrimination happens, and that's mm -hmm. why um, we don't even recognize the power dynamic and things like that is because it just we've just never, you know, I've never experienced being deaf, and until I studied mm -hmm. interpreting, I didn't know how uh, discriminatory people were towards deaf people. I didn't realize how awful they were. I mean, my my friend had to fire her pediatrician because he wouldn't get her an interpreter. He said, no, you're not my patient. What? Yeah, that's illegal, <laughs> friends. That's, that's illegal, oh, first of all. God. And second of all, really, the five-year-old is going to tell her mom what her medicine needs to be? You see the flaw in this logic? Like, oh my I get God. that the child is hearing, but... Really? Um, You're not going to get an interpreter, which, by the way, the government pays you back for? <sighs> really? Yeah. Wow. So those kinds of things are so common that a deaf person could spend their entire life in a courtroom suing. They really could. Wow. That's, it's really that's sad. frustrating. Yeah. The things you learn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, how, I mean, how have you seen diversity done wrong in a romantic subplot in SFF? I think the best, or not best, that's the wrong word. I think. Worst? Biggest, the biggest faux pas. I don't know. Uh, the, the best way you can work, mess it up is kind of what I was trying to say. It's an awful mm -hmm. way to say it, but that's what I say. Um, is, is ignoring, ignoring the differences. Mm -hmm. um, and so like the ambiguously it, brown character who's like. Yeah, or, or we won't mention, we know that their races are different, but we won't really mention it. We won't talk oh, about how that affects the way out. Shh, shh, you coward. know? <laughs> oh, yeah. And then, and then, you know, after the book gets published, they pull Rowling and they're like, oh yeah, no, this character was black and this character was, you know, gay or, or whatever. And it's just mm -hmm. like, no, no. Yeah, all you do is story. change the description and they're a white person. Mm. No, you don't do that. No, 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 no. You have to make sure that they actually match the, the culture and that mm -hmm. that's actually a topic that comes up because it comes up, you know? Yeah. So I think that's a way that they get it wrong is ignoring it in the first place. Yeah. Um, another way that I've seen getting wrong, especially in regards to ACE representation is they'll have like their asexuality is cured. Like the, yeah. So they'll have this, you know, ACE character start a romantic relationship with somebody else and like, over the course of their story, like these characters are like, oh yeah, no, now I like who like usually starts off the story sex repulse too, 
end the story but like oh yeah no i totally love sex and i'm totally attracted to you know all these different people and blah blah, blah. and i was like that is not how that works <laughs> um you want to learn about demisexuality which is sexual attraction to a person that you already have an emotional bond to that's something or gray sexuality where you are sexually attracted to someone only under specific circumstances and i'm sure that there are many many more that i don't know about and i'm very sorry about that but like there it's asexuality is not a disease that needs to be cured <laughs> Yeah. Oh. I, I don't think anybody really wants to, to be reading something and be told mm -hmm. that they are broken and they need to be fixed. Yeah. And it's and it's like a rehash of, you know, um, of curing lesbianism. Like when you have a, 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 a le like the true. idea that this, this woman who says she's lesbian, oh, she just needs to have sex with a guy and then it'll be fine. And that attitude, by the way, leads to things like curative rape. So I hate to see that in my fiction because it's just like, yeah. that's, it, it betrays a shocking misunderstanding and lack of empathy yeah. toward these minority groups. And it yeah. pisses me off so bad. And everyone's just like, oh, it's just a story. It's like, don't read it if you don't like it. And it's just sci-fi and fancy, like, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, it affects yeah. how we see the world and how we view the world. There have been studies yeah. on this. They're continuing to, ugh. Uh, yeah. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, you have a little bit of an opinion here. <laughs> it actually so reminds me of this channel. <laughs> it actually <laughs> reminds me of our earlier conversation where I was like, oh, like Sheldon from Big Bang Theory. And you were like, oh, no. Yeah, oh, my God. Yeah, no. No, no, no. no. <laughs> No, so, and, shame face and, over here. And, and some <laughs> people were like, you know, speaking to people who have autism. And like they re like some people like them, and a lot of people I know who have autism they hate the Sheldon representation. They they just despise it, and it's like it's become like the only way that autism is represented in in media and sci-fi and fantasy. And that's not true. It is a whole like you can have ten different people with autism, and they all act and react totally and different. have different in totally different ways. And yeah. uh, it makes me sad. Anyway, yeah. moving on. Villain couples, the healthy kind. I am so sad that we only ever see a few villain couples. In, in yeah, it's not really common. Yeah, and well, and you know the reason why, as an author, I'm sure because like we want to make our villains scary, and yeah. you can't really do that if you know they're coming home snuggling with it with their with their sweetheart, like yeah. uh, it, especially if it's a pure evil villain. Like that just that but just. But I feel like. I feel like people are writers are trying to create a psychopath or a sociopath, but they don't really know what that looks like again. Mm. And so I feel like they're they're going back to this uh, this stereotypical look of a villain. Mm. And um, I've heard people call it the baddie bad bad. I'm bad just because I'm bad because I want to do bad things. So I'm going to do bad things to make you I'm feel bad so I can bad. do more that bad things. <laughs> right? But I think that's. Way more interesting than pure evil. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes. And so I think what they're trying to do is create a psychopath or a sociopath. Mm -hmm. But psychopaths and sociopaths have relationships. They have mm -hmm. families. So yeah. watch um, Sherlock. I won't <laughs> talk about my family at all. <clears throat> but they do. <laughs> they, they do. They have relationships. They have families. They're just right. mean the people. <laughs> right. So. Well, and I, I personally really like it when it's like, you know, it's a power couple. It's, it's a, which automatically tells, but when it's, you know, you got a villain couple. So that automatically tells like, you know, sympathetic villain, complex villain, which are all the okay. rage these days. Um, mm. And it's, so it's like seeing that different side of them, like, yeah, they want to like, you know, just destroy our heroes and like, you know, conquer this kingdom uh, and like yeah they, they they torture and murder or whatever but when it's people that they love and they care about you see it like they're doing it for them or it's like they're they're doing it because they think it's the right thing to do to protect their loved ones and it's like mm -hmm. that makes them totally more interesting mm -hmm. and it gives them motivation exactly and i especially mm -hmm. love it when the person that they're married to or in love with is a villain in their own right because mm -hmm. then you get the villain power couple yeah. And it's amazing. And it's so rare. <laughs> Do you know what's freaky is having somebody who's willing to go and to just, just harm people. 
Mm. And then go home and kiss their babies. Oh, God, yes. You know what gives you the chills? <laughs> is that because that is a true psychopath. That's a true mm-hmm. sociopath. But we just assume they don't have those relationships, like I said. But no, they go home and kiss their babies. Yeah. Which is what or, makes them creepy. <laughs> and, it, and you could go so deep into the psychology here because, like, you know, especially if, you know, the people that they're, that they're tormenting or murdering, like, they dehumanize them in their own mind. Yeah. But like so, so seeing that that duality, like um, I don't know if you watch Snowpiercer, the the TNT show. Mm. So it's based off of the the book and the 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 graphic novel and the movie of the same name. But it's like same premise, different, totally different deal. But it's like basically climate change has completely screwed up the planet, and all the survivors are in this massive train over a thousand cars long, and it's like going around the world because that's the only way that it keeps its battery power. And the first class people live in luxury in the head. And then you got the second and third class. And then the stowaways are the tailies and they're abused. And it's like horrible conditions. And it's like a whole big thing on like class warfare and revolution and all stuff. Great show. Highly recommend. One of the reasons that I love it is that near the end of season one, two of the bad guys start a relationship together. And they're mm. like, they're, they're a villain couple and they're a villain power couple. Like they first is like, you know, kind of creating this little alliance. And then they actually, like, you see, like, it, it's real. Like they care about each other. They love each other. They, you know, they're trying to find comfort with each other. And it's like really sweet. And then one of them, you know, the, the good guys win, but one of those villain couples, the one of the people in that is, is killed in that. And mm. you can see the impact that has on the survivor and how sad yeah. they are and how crushed they are that this person that they really cared about died. And yeah. it's going to cause problems later because season two is coming out and they're still in a position of power. So, oh dear. yeah. And that's another thing that you can play with, with, with a villain couple type of thing is like, okay, well, you have a very bittersweet victory here for the good guys because, you know, they, they managed to, to overcome this obstacle. But like, if your readers are attached to this other villain, that's gonna, you know, cause a complicated emotional response in them. And even if they're not, the other villain is gonna be really upset that their significant other is either dead or hurt. Yeah. And we just we just need to see more of that in fiction. <laughs> Definitely more of a variety of, of villains. Um, I was thinking of a specific uh, movie as well while you were talking. Uh, there's one called Love and Friendship. If you like the Regency era things, um, Jane Austen type movies, hmm. I loved love and friendship. I loved it. The main character is the villain. The protagonist is the villain. And I love that about it. And it's a Regency era, which those are just so, they're almost not synonymous, but they worked so well in this. And I feel like by the end, she kind of got exactly what she wanted and what Mm -hmm. she deserved. And it ended up in kind of a, a villain, a villain coupling. And it was just very, just fascinating because you know she's manipulating as the story goes along you know you know what you very quickly you're like you're an awful person (laughs) you're a really awful person that's hilarious and it was she was the protagonist she was the main character of this story when have you seen villain couples written wrong you know i have not read any villain couples that I don't know. Oh, look at that. I'm messing um, with my hair too much. It's like <laughs> I guess the only times that I've seen them wrong is when like when they're toxic and then held still held up as relationship goals. Like when when Suicide Squad came out, you know, you had all those Harley Quinn and Joker couple mm-hmm. and, and cosplays and all with the hashtag mm-hmm. romance ro- you know, romance goals, hashtag relationship goals. No, <laughs> you do not mm. want a Joker Mm-mm. Harley Quinn romance and like Mm-mm. It's a fascinating, like their their relationship is fascinating in the comics, in the movies, like it's great, but like it, it's horribly toxic. And it's even acknowledged mm. in story, like Harley leaves him because he's such an abusive bastard. And yeah, like- he's pretty awful to her. Yeah, but I, I guess it's more of a, of a, of a, of an outsider's reaction to it that that it it, that irks me because like the writer Mm. will say no this is toxic and the characters will say no this is toxic and everyone the audience and the readers will be like oh it's so cute the audience is shipping them the whole time Uh, 
that's probably because there's too much toxicity in romance right now. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's kind yeah, of a trend. No, we're, we're, yeah. we're, uh, we, we've grown a callus to it. Um, yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah, I've got yeah. a comment here saying how, like, you know, oh, I could never write a book. I just want everyone to be happy. I don't know if you meant uh, everyone outside or everyone in the book. Um, <laughs> not everyone's going to be happy. Like, you can, you, like, some, one person's absolutely all-time favorite story is another person's trash and, mm. and vice versa. But, like, yeah, I guess, you know, whenever I do these trope videos, everyone's just like, you know, oh, it's like, you know, it's how can you not like this or how can you like this or it's like you know just don't tell other people how to write it's like blah 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 it's like i'm not telling you how to write i am telling you what oh, i yeah. christina like and what cammy likes yeah. and how it's been botched before and the general mood that we get but i'm not telling you you cannot write this thing if you're talented mm -hmm. enough to pull off a really horrible trope do it ah uh, yeah yeah i love it when they when they subvert I love it when they subvert tropes. It's amazing. Um, it's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Like, it's not like, yeah. like you write it so, like, you know, you think it's going to go one way. And even, so, like, you're still reading because, like, you're invested in the characters. And you're like, oh, I know where this is going. But it's still a cute story. So I'll still, and then, like, bam. <laughs> it's like, did not see that coming. Did not see that character dying. Did not see that character surviving. Did not yes. see that character hooking up with that one or that one being evil. I just did not see it. And I love it. That yes it's my favorite i uh, love it plot twists are for another time uh, okay mm, yeah uh when the dangerous vicious characters are dorky and adorable together this one's mostly on the list because i am a, a huge sucker for those characters we all know them where they're like gruff and kind of distant and bad like boy. scary and I'm not necessarily even a bad boy but like you know a wolverine or like uh -huh. you know you know that type and then like you get to know them and you get close to them and they're actually a big giant marshmallow like mm. i love that <laughs> it's so <laughs> like it's like it's they're layered and they're the good yeah. guys so they're easy to root for but like they've clearly gone through some trauma or abuse or whatever, but they're they're working through it, but they don't trust easily. And you just want to take them and you want to like wrap them up in blankets and put them in front of the fire and give them a nice, <laughs> healthy, romantic relationship. So they're happy. So they're happy. Here's some hot cocoa. <laughs> oh, no. That's all I want. That's all I want. <laughs> Somebody write her that book. That's all she wants in life. I mean, Rick Riordan already wrote it. Um, oh, there's... oh, my bad. Don't write the book. And this is spoilers, by the way, for um, the, um, the the Heroes of Olympus series and early Trials of Apollo series, book book one. Um, but there is a, there's a character, uh, Nico D'Angelo, the son of Hades, uh, the Greek god of death and the underworld. And, like, he, long story short... He, he's gay and he's got a lot of issues that he, he's he's working through over the course of the years of Olympus and he he overcomes them and it's great and he starts dating an opposite the, uh, a son of Apollo so it, so it's gay it's opposite to try because will the son of Apollo yeah. is a healer and a total goofball and a oh, dork okay. and then they get together and Nico D'Angelo it I should say is still like kind of gruff and kind of closed off a little bit and like still has the black aesthetic thing going on but like he like will will get him to do like really dorky cute datey stuff and while Nico will like kind of roll his eyes or like, like you can tell he still actually loves it like I love yeah. that <laughs> That's cute. Yeah. That's but, cute. Know, that's it's three. It's a, it's a power couple. It's an opposite track. It's gay mm -hmm. or, and it's dangerous, vicious characters or dorky. That is just your, I want to say triple threat, but <laughs> quadruple. The quadruple threat for you. <laughs> it's amazing. And, and like, yeah. you know, later one too, I think it's at five too, technically when we, when we get to the unrequited. Um, but yeah, no, I, I just, I just love that. I love, tough exterior marshmallow gooey interior and i love it when that you know manifests itself in the relationship yeah so i have to add a not a caveat but a, mm -hmm. just add a little bit to this Footnote. um yes note <laughs> put it right there um <laughs> so when you are doing uh the bad boy or the anti-hero or whatever you mm -hmm. want to call them um a lot of writers are actually unintentionally creating sociopaths 
for their mm. love interests instead of for their villains. It's actually <laughs> really common <laughs> and it's bad. Don't do it. <laughs> no, no, Don't yeah. be that person. Okay. So a, a psychopath or a sociopath, they, they've mm -hmm. actually done away with those terms. It's called antisocial personality disorder now. And okay they don't have the ability to feel empathy for another person. They just, they just don't. They, mm -hmm. they like things, they feel pain, they whatever, but they don't think of the world in terms of feelings and love and connection and things like that. And so um, I think that often what they're trying to create is something, somebody that that's beautifully broken, somebody <laughs> that, that, you know what I'm saying? Like they so are so rough, but, about, but they yes. can't it a little bit which you can do which you can do mm -hmm. that's that's totally that's totally a thing when there really is that marshmallow underneath mm -hmm. and they they're just afraid to be who they are or they right. just have kind of a rough around the edges kind of personality but um oftentimes what they're writing is not rough around the edges it's i i just don't have the ability to connect with you i don't have the ability mm -hmm. to feel sorry for you i don't know what you're going through at best it's a narcissist Mm -hmm. which um they just don't they just don't feel for other people but mm -hmm. at worst it's it's a full-on psychopath and yeah. congratulations you've just told a room full of little girls that are reading it that this is what they need to look forward to uh, in their future so don't yeah. do that. Uh, don't be that person yeah. so um, know, know what a just know what a psychopath looks like yeah. so that you can write it into the right characters and do mm -hmm. it intentionally if you want to do a love interest that's a psychopath by all means do it but do it intentionally mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying like there was this, um, there was this horror movie i saw where it was it was a a, a a couple like some honeymoon getaway thing and it was this this couple who killed other couples and then assumed their identities um and one of them was um you know, had that disorder, and the thing, and the writers knew, and in fact, he he's talking about it to to his to his wife, and she's upset because she loves him, but he doesn't really love her. And his response was, "I love the idea of loving you," mm -hmm. and that that stuck with me because it's like that 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 that's kind of sad, and like because it's clearly it's clearly he he wants to connect with her and like this murdering people and assuming their identities newlyweds too is yeah. the only way that they can do it and it's just like uh, uh yeah, yeah. But. so if you want to see a great great video on youtube about mm -hmm. a psychopath there is this channel called special books by special kids mm -hmm. and this yeah he interviews people with um either uh, psychological diagnoses or physical deformities, or I'm not going to note that right now. <laughs> stigma, stigmatized word. Anyway, um, that are otherwise abled, right? And mm -hmm. he interviews them and talks about what their lives are like. And he was approached by a a young man with a with a diagnosis of um, anti personal uh, anti social personality disorder. And the way that he talks about his relationship with the people that he cares about is mm -hmm. what I find most fascinating. He doesn't use words like love and like and feel. Anything that has a connotation, a feeling connotation, it's almost like it doesn't exist in his vo vocabulary, which huh. is fascinating. And he sees his relationships with people as um, kind of transactional. My life mm -hmm. is better when you're in it. And I, so, so I want you to be in it because it's better that way. So I know that people feel love this way or whatever. So I need to do these things so that you feel whatever you're going to feel. And so that you stay and benefit my life that way. So it's so like, it's like a fixed love language type of thing. It's kind of his weird love language, which I found really extremely fascinating. Yeah. I mean, he's got this weird, so he doesn't attach to people emotionally, but he knows that his life is better with them in it. And so he, he deliberately does things to keep them. So not manipulating them. And he said, I have to remind myself when somebody's grandma dies to ask them if they're okay and that they'd like to talk about it. Because I don't feel sorry for them that their grandma died, but I know that a lot of people feel sad when their grandma mm. dies. So I have to, it's a logical thing. I know yeah. this. And so I have to remind myself this and I have to remind myself to say the right things, to use the right words. Very, very, very fascinating. He seemed like a high functioning sociopath, but I, Huh. I wouldn't know with my psychology degree, but that is a fantastic. It, I think it's called Interview with a Sociopath. So good. Write a villain. 
And the channel yeah. itself is a, what was it? Special books by special kids or something? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if all of them have written a book or if that's just how it started. I don't know, but it was a great, great story. Great interview. I'm going to check out that channel. So that's pretty much covers how they can get that trope wrong. Um, I was just going to say when they, when they go too far in the cutesy stuff, it's like this character would never do that. <laughs> like, yeah. or yeah, no, don't. I think this is a problem with, with a lot of romantic subplot tropes, which is where like they'll they'll change the character when they're with their significant other or with their crush. And not in the, oh, they become more awkward, they, they stumble over their words type of thing because they're nervous around them, but in the like total complete personality change. And as always, changing your characters for the sake of whatever plot is going on is a bad thing. Like character consistency is key. And I say this as someone who struggles with character consistency in some of her work. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think yours had a little more depth. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think what you're talking about, like if you're actually looking into personality disorders would be um, dissociative identity identity disorder. And they do flip flop. So if you want yeah, to know that, 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 but like, dissociative identity. Yeah, but this is like, you know. Unintentional. Is, yeah, the. They're not, they're not doing that. Um, okay, what do we got? Ah, next up, the long-term relationship. So I'm sure you've noticed whenever you pick up a book or you read or you watch a, a show or a movie and they have a romantic subplot going on, it's, it's always the same, it's almost always the same same spot where they do it where like it's it's the meet cute maybe they've met before but they're still like you know in the you know don't really know you know she it's usually she doesn't know that he exists or like they you know only interact in a work setting or something like that and then the the romantic subplot is all about them getting together and it ends on the big kiss like mm -hmm. that's where it ends we're not going to talk about all the relationship problems that come in afterwards because that's boring mm -hmm. too hard i don't know <laughs> yeah but but i love it when like you know it, and it usually happens in, in series because like the first book will have that that thing and then like the second and third will have it you know will we'll follow the relationship as it actually progresses um but i like it when when we meet the characters and they've you know been dating for like five years or they've been married for 10 years and like the you know, the there might not even be a r romantic subplot per se going on. It's just like, yeah, they're married. Like that's that's a part of who the, that's these characters' relationship with each other. Um, or the the subplot will be like, you know, one of them like they want to have kids, and like the, you know, for some sci-fi rule says that they can't, or like they, you know, have found this, you know magical rock thing and it's putting strain on their or something like that like mm. i just i just like seeing in fiction it's so rare to see fiction where the the relationship is is already standing it's it's already it's already there yeah. already this they're not they're not building mm -hmm. it and i get why yeah. they focus on the building because that's like in many ways more exciting mm -hmm. than the, the it's the romantic story. love yeah mm -hmm. but it's like Come on, I don't. I don't want to see a hundred books of honeymoon phase. I want like what happens next. Like what you know. What? <laughs> off of my mind. We have so many like writer shortcuts. I'm sure you've like you know, or it's like you know, all you gotta do is stare at each other for five seconds as soft music plays in the background, and you know they're in love. And but we have none of those shortcuts for when the relationship is actually a relationship. Yeah. Yeah, there's something to be said, though, for romantic love. People love it, and people want to read it. And I know sometimes when couples get together, I get bored after <laughs> they get married or after they whatever. And I think it has something to do with the writing, honestly, because I've mm -hmm. seen long-term relationships that I've loved, mm -hmm. and then I've seen ones that I only wanted to read their courtship. Mm -hmm. Now that that's done, I'm done. You know, like I'm not interested in your story anymore. So I think it has a lot to do with how it's put together. Because, I mean, one of my favorite shows from, from my childhood, um, I think you and I might be a different age. I think I just dated myself. But um, uh, Boy Meets World. Heard of it. it. I love that show. They meet each other as little children. And she kisses him for the first time when they're like 11. And he's like, that was gross. <laughs> you know, it's like. 
<laughs> and then they start dating when they're a little, when they're like 13, 14, and they eventually they get married and they go to college together. And so you actually follow them through from the first time they meet all the way through college and um, newlywed college. So I don't think they actually have a baby in the series, but it's it's exactly what you're talking about. It's that long term relationship and right. how they overcome the challenges. I remember their apartment was so nasty that like they mm -hmm. they were so hungry, like they were poor college students that they were like, I saw I saw something on the wall and I licked it. Why would you do that? Because it's like this broken down <laughs> apartment. And he's like, I don't remember who which character it was, but they're like, I was so hungry. <laughs> oh. and it was like food. <laughs> You know, like it, it talks about the real, the real parts of the relationship, mm -hmm. but in the context of those fun characters and the quirky right. dynamics they have. Right. Um, yeah. I don't know if you ever saw the show. I know you have a, a small child and if you haven't seen the show and when he gets to that age, show him this show, uh, Avatar, The Last Airbender. Favorite. I watched it without my kids. Are you kidding me? <laughs> have you read the comics that takes place afterwards? We find out what happened. Well, first of all, we find out what happens to Zuko's mom. Uh, second of all, um, you know how in the Legend of Korra, the, it takes place mostly in Republic City. Well, basically, what the comics are is they take place one year after the end of the war, and it's basically them building this city and dealing with the fallout of a hundred years of war. You know, Zuko goes starts going a little nuts. Um, yeah. You know, starts looking for his mom, and then yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah, and then well, there's, my, um, my my computer's told me it's dying. I don't oh, know. What I'm <laughs> okay, I have my charger. Okay. Ah. Um, okay, give me one second. You can okay. you can keep talking. I'll keep talking. So, um, in the comics, when the thing is, you know, the Fire Nation took a lot of Earth Kingdom land and made colonies, and one of these colonies is literally 100 years old. Like they have, um, you know, generations of firebenders and earthbenders marrying each other and having families together. You know, there's a earthbender girl who claims she is fire nation because that's her dad's nation. Um, and, <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so there's this, this yeah, so there's a part where basically, you know, the Earth King, you're just in time for when the Earth King and the Fire Nation are almost at war again over this colony that is mixed Earth Kingdom and Fire Nation. You know, Zuko wants to keep them as it is. The Earth King wants his land back. And Katara mm. basically points, you know, Aang is at first on the side of the Earth King saying we need to get the Fire Nation out of here, like four nations, come on. And Katara is just like, so you're saying that these, you know, Earthbenders and Firebenders should not marry and have kids and he's just like well and he's in Katara's like I'm a waterbender you're an airbender by your logic we shouldn't be together mm -hmm. so she basically you like you know they, they've been dating for a year they loved each other and adore each other and it's like you you basically see how that plays into Aang's broader political decisions and essentially the creation of Republic City well talk about diverse couples I know yeah, right <laughs> That's a good um, example of how yeah, it affects exactly. you. Yeah. That's your yeah, Legend of Korra. For all its faults, it did it did end on an interracial gay couple, the first in in kids animation. Oh. Oh. Um, I did yeah, not watch and, the whole series, so I didn't even know that. Yeah, neither did I really until I really saw it online. And then Shira, Princesses of Power, blew it out of the water. <laughs> that is an amazing gay kids show. It's literally been called that les the lesbian kids show on Twitter. It's like interesting amazing i love it so um, tell me where i can watch that series the netflix. um all of the avatar things are on netflix i believe so yes okay. um i know that avatar last year at least definitely did just come to netflix um okay. so you should be able to find out that and then you can watch she-ra and then the dragon prince mm -hmm. so okay. you have a lot of good diverse um <clears throat> excuse me a lot of diverse thing going on um Long-term relationships gone wrong, done wrong. Have you seen like, you know, an author doing it, like, especially in a sci-fi fantasy setting where like it's a long-term relationship and there it's the romantic subplot, but like it's, it's miswritten or mishandled. Yeah. I'm going to go back to dysfunction on <laughs> this one. I'm or when go back to... attempted to cheat. Yeah. That which is, I'm just wrapping everything bad up into <laughs> dysfunction, but yeah, where they, 
where they they have major communication mm-hmm. issues or one partner cheats or things like that. And they just kind of like keep going. They just are like, it's okay. We're, we're in love. So it's okay if you did this horrible thing to me. I, I forgive you automatically. Why you know? talk about it? <laughs> doesn't um, work that way in real life. It just doesn't. One thing that I'm tired of seeing, and it showed up in Frozen too, and I feel like if they'd taken it a different direction, it would have been a better movie. Um, but where the they've been dating for a while, and the guy wants to propose, and mm-hmm. keeps running into increasingly implausible scenarios and situations where he can't. Mm-hmm. And it's, oh, I mean, like, I get it that, you know, proposing to some, I mean, I don't because I've never had to do that. But intellectually, I understand <laughs> that having to propose to someone is stressful and kind yeah. of scary. But so I can see why that would be a thing. But at the same time, it's like, like, if it's, that's like the only, it's like the only thing that they have going on. I did see that subverted in a Charlie's Angels movie which was cute where like this entire movie that they think that one of their, their, their girls is going to be um that her boyfriend is going to propose to her because they're moving in together. And it's like a huge step. And it's like this big thing where they're afraid that if she marries him, it's going to break apart the angels and blah, blah, blah. And he gives at the end of the movie, he gives her this little jewelry box and it's a puppy's name tag. He got her a dog. That's funny. <laughs> and it's just like, I know. I, I thought it was cute. Dogs. That's cute. really funny. Yeah. So with Frozen, that actually didn't bother me at all. I actually liked it because I felt like he was like, I just want to ask the girl to marry me. <laughs> Can I oh, please yeah. him something? Go my way. It was, it's, not not even bad. it's not that it was bad. It's just in the broader context of, you know, Elsa essentially leaving her kingdom to rule someone a totally different kingdom and Anna taking over as queen, that that subplot should have focused on that. None of Anna's training has, you know, Elsa, at least as the eldest, was trained to be queen. Anna mm-hmm. wasn't. And Kristoff mm-hmm. is like, well, shit, now the girl I want to marry is going to be a queen. If I marry her, is that going to make me a king? I don't know how to king. I collect ice. I collect <laughs> ice. Yeah. Like, if I'd gone a little deeper into that, that would have been cool. But it's a Disney movie and it's a sequel. So I'm not going to die on that hill. <laughs> I actually heard that they they researched a lot of psychology when they looked into that to mm-hmm. um, to talk about the progression of relationships and mm-hmm. um, the progression of like romantic relationships as well as like sibling relationships mm-hmm. and sibling rivalries and all these different types of things. So that when they went mm-hmm. back to it, they they did. I mean, the characters. Yeah, I mean, the characters were all great, and I was very pleased to see that you know in the sequel they're still together. A mm-hmm. lot of times in sequels, like the one of the big problems will be that the relationship is having problems or they've broken up or one of them's died mm-hmm. or whatever. And it's like you rarely get to see them the being success. in a relationship. Yeah. The success, the long term success versus mm-hmm. just the romantic high. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Next up, we got confident and consensual in bed. Like, I don't know what, what what was I think when I wrote that. Um, oh yeah, that's right. So we were we were talking about like you know I think like either we we had um where it was like I can't talk right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's nine o'clock <laughs> where I'm at. I'm over here not laughing at you. <laughs> <laughs> but like you know you, a lot I, a lot of times it I guess it annoys me a little bit to see the the blushing virgin trope. And like, I, I I mean, they exist, obviously. I think everyone's a little nervous their first time and I'm gonna ask my brother to leave real quick. Um, he's the one watching this. I don't think he wants to hear his big sister talk about sex. Um, <laughs> but I mean, at the same time, like, I mean, like the, the blushing virgin is like, you know, whenever you have, like, it, it's always, you know, whore versus virgin and like you're either like you know have had sex a ton of times and that's why you're not nervous about any of it or you've never had sex at all and you're super super nervous about it like can't we have an adventurous virgin can't we have like just healthy sexuality like can't we just have a a, you know someone who's like confident maybe a little nervous but like having fun and consensual I want to stress that consensual in bed like if you're gonna show it like get a little creative with it yeah, I feel like if, if somebody is really that apprehensive or that scared, there's mm-hmm. a there's either a cultural aspect to it mm-hmm. or 
there's really a lack of information, you know, mm -hmm. um, or a lack of like there, like there's a stigma to it almost, like mm -hmm. something to be overcome. I know in some cultures, um, there's a little especially bit. Huh? Especially, sorry, especially if it's a guy. Like we see a ton of women virgins in in stories because they're supposed to remain virgins until they meet the one or until they're married. But like, mm. God forbid, your male character has a first time. Yeah, yeah, and but I think there's some some slut shaming that happens, mm. and so in some cultures that's actually kind of normal. The the blushing virgin mm. kind of thing is normal. Um, I happen to be from one of those cultures. That's why I know. Gotta luck for my knowledge. <laughs> Name the movie quote. <laughs> Cold star for anybody that names it. Um, in the chat. Anyway, um, yeah. And so in cultures like that, they that's something that they have to kind of try and figure out as they start mm -hmm. having those types of relationships. And so, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, it's very, very common. So. I think that if you're going to do a blushing bride it, or blushing virgin or whatever, um, just make sure that you know what you're writing. Mm -hmm. Like if, you, if you're going to do it, add something to it. Add that it's a cultural thing. Add that there was some trauma, maybe some sexual mm -hmm. abuse. Add, add to it. There's got to be a reason why. Not just, oh, you know. It's or, not like, or, like, or like they're, they're, they're you know, nervous and, and blushing and, and whatever, but they seem like super adventurous, like, you know, all right, let's do this, like type of thing. Or like, um, I don't, not aggressive, assertive. Yeah. Be an assertive virgin. <laughs> like, <laughs> Can we have one of those, please? <laughs> <laughs> um, um. Uh, especially if it's like, you know, a, an assertive woman version, because like, you know, women aren't supposed to want to have sex or like they're yeah. supposed to be to be. Ch and like the whole thing is kind of creepy. Like, you know, they're supposed to be chaste and they're supposed to be, you know, co almost coerced into it, especially if it's a first time type of thing. And it's just like, mm, you are crossing several consensuality lines and I'm going to need you to step back uh, out of the room. <laughs> Yeah. And it's, yeah, no, I don't, yeah. I don't know. I guess, yeah, I, I, I ah, there you are. <laughs> I clicked on, um, I, I guess, I guess I just want to see more than just, you know, the, the experienced guy and the, the shy, blushing girl. You know, I guess I just want to want to expand my horizons be, beyond that. That that's all I'm asking for. I feel like that goes very frequently with the the bad boy or antihero trope because mm -hmm. um, we're usually paired with the, with the girl next door mm -hmm. cute girl archetype. Yeah, who's who's never done anything like this before, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, I think no. If you like always said that. Now, if you want to be accurate, have it be that the guy comes quickly, but the woman has no idea how to make the woman come. Like that's, and she's disappointed. Like this is what sex is about. Come on, it's. I feel like this has been hyped up too much. Yeah, let's let's move on. Let's try a different type. Let's uh, <laughs> ow, ow. let's. Um, I just I just want to see that women are written as they are, mm -hmm. and they are written as competent mm -hmm. and. A strong female lead doesn't have to be a badass. Mm -hmm. um, can be, but doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. And they're strong in their in their understanding of who they are as a person, mm -hmm. in their own assertive with their own desires and needs, and um, understanding their own sexuality and sensuality and mm -hmm. things like that. Like, yeah. can we write women who are real or who? <laughs> I feel like you're asking for a little too much there, Cammie. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Write good women. <laughs> Please. Uh, all right, we got two more. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Unrequited is not really unrequited. So this is one of the few super cheesy tropes that I actually really like, especially mm -hmm. if it's done well. Like, you know, the setup will be like, oh, I like this person, but, like, they don't like me like that. And, you know, it's whatever's fine like I'm just gonna value our friendship or I'm just gonna work with them or like whatever and then like 
near the end, like, you know, you find out that you, the person has liked them like the entire time and has been tuned, like basically undergoing the same dilemma. And it's like so cute where there was like that whole, oh my God, we're both idiots moment. (laughs) And then they get together. Like, I love it. (laughs) uh, It's so cute. It's so implausible, but so cute. (laughs) Yeah. Enter Hallmark here. (laughs) I know. (laughs) (laughs) I I love this trope. I really do. <laughs> I really do. Oh, you guys left me. <laughs> I, ah, I'm I'm such a nerd for that. I know, especially if like you know you're seeing it from a P, if, if like the it's the POV character, the the narrator basically, who is like very, you know, not very aware of their surroundings. So like they're almost an unreliable narrator. So you, the mm-hmm. audience, are led to believe that this other person, their interest doesn't like them or like doesn't love them that way. And then basically the other person's like, you have no situational awareness. I've been trying to ask you out for three goddamn weeks. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I've read some where it's, it's even longer than that, where it's like almost like years that this is building and they secretly love each other. You know. Oh, are you chopping in and out, or is that just my? Are you there, Christina? <laughs> Hello. She's gone. Oh, I'm here. There you are. <laughs> was it me that disappeared, or it you? You. <laughs> oh. It was you. It was me. Sorry. <laughs> Technical difficulty. See, you thought you had the technology problems. <laughs> It's a curse. It spreads. <laughs> um, uh, this was this was something that was also done. Um, going going back to the the Rick Riordan thing, I mentioned the the Nico D'Angelo and the Will Solace were like Nico is I don't want to say damaged, but like he believes that because he is a son of Hades, the most hated Olympian, and you know because of who he and he's a boy at a time and like because of all this other stuff that he is like unlovable that nobody cares about him that nobody can care about him or can love him and he basically like accumulates into like this total blow up you know near the, when they're all, when he and will are like surrounded by enemies i might add and like accumulates in this blow up and will just goes off like he's basically like no the only reason that we're not hanging out with you and that we're not inviting you to our table is that you keep pushing us away and mm. that was just like a it was a it was a total slap in the face to Nico and to the reader because we've basically been taking Nico's word for it, his struggles. And so when Will is telling him, no, we've been trying to invite you to our stuff and, and and involve you in our things. And I've been trying to like ask you out and you just keep shoving us away. And I mean it's very in character for Nico. And it's it so I really like it when when that happens, where it's like you know, a, a a bitch slap, basically, where it's just like, get your head out of your ass. Like, the world doesn't revolve around you. You're not this one lone, you know, more moral soul wandering around, unable to have friends. We're trying to be your friend. You're just making it too damn difficult. Are you sure the world doesn't re- revolve around me? Because I thought it did. <laughs> I, I was pretty sure. <laughs> As my dad would like to say to me and my brother whenever we were being super diva, the wor- universe does not revolve around you. <sighs> um, the sun. Yeah. <laughs> um, when have you ever seen this trope done wrong? <sighs> what trope are we on? <laughs> <laughs> the unrequited is not really requ- unrequited. <laughs> okay. Um... I think when there's too much cheese in this. Or when when one conversation would clear it all up. Yes. When it doesn't, when there's something about it that doesn't ring true. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like when I'm reading something and then there's something off, it kind of, um, so when you're reading it, you you have to suspend your disbelief. But then when you read something that feels off, it kind of breaks that that illusionment almost. Mm -hmm. Like that, it, it breaks that bond that you have with the book. I don't know if that makes any sense, but no, it just it's, kind of like, I, it's jarring. I get this very thin line, you know, especially in something like a sci-fi fantasy setting where we're careful. already suspending our disbelief to, you know, let magic or dragons or, or whatever, you know, yeah. just accept that as a temporary reality. The thing is, you know, people still have to act like people. Mm-hmm. So, and that's, that's, I think, where the break comes. And also internal cons- consistency. 
Because even if your story doesn't revolve around humans, if they involve around, you know, aliens or animals or dragons or, or whatever, like they're still, they still got to be human enough. And they, you got to mm -hmm. set up the, the cultural practices and the, and their, their thought process in a way that, that makes sense to humans who are, this doesn't make yeah. sense. Yeah. And I'm Bra I like how Brandon Sanderson says it. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen his lectures on YouTube, but he I haven't seen he teaches because I've read his work. So good. They are so good. I binge watched like, four years of his lectures. Yay! Uh, Plug for Brandon Sanderson. Hashtag Brandon Love. <laughs> anyway, what was it that you were saying? Oh, like, so what he is says that, the, that the, writing is... I'm sorry, it's choppy again. <laughs> or just say did that our Lord and your Brandon Sanderson says about this. Yes. So the distinguished Brandon Sanderson <laughs> says um, that you're mixing the real with the strange. And I think depending on your genre, you're going to have more strange or more real. Um, but really, you have to have those real elements. If your cultures don't have a tie to real life or if your character's reactions don't feel real then it's not going to feel there's not going to be that um that element of realism that helps people suspend their disbelief i apologize for anyone who is watching this you disappeared on me again i did i don't know if you heard me that. <laughs> i was did. talking like, to myself we both that's what happened <laughs> I can't hear you. We, we both dropped and then I got a pop up that said, you know, we're having trouble with the internet connection. And I was bitching about it the whole time. We were both talking to ourselves. No big deal. Oh, no, and you're gone again. Hello. I wonder if I'm on the wrong one. Not hear that. <laughs> I, I can hear you this now. Last you okay. There? Okay. Now I'm here. Let's quickly wrap up our last trope. <laughs> oh, shit. She's frozen again. Damn it. Okay, let me try something. Sorry, guys. Bear with me. Okay, I'm here. I think I solved the problem. Anything? No. Nope. New technology. Uh, technology okay, are you there? In the butt. <laughs> yes. Okay. I think I fixed so the problem. So how much of what I said did you actually hear? Nothing. <laughs> You were just starting your quote on Brandon Sanderson about how you're mixing the real with the strange. Yes. So depending on the genre you write, that's going to determine how much you're real mute. and how much strange. What? Yeah. Can you hear okay. me? You're, you're on a delay. Now I can hear you. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I got it. So if you're obviously writing, if you're writing a sci-fi or a fantasy, obviously you're going to be, um, having a lot more strange in it. Mm -hmm. And if you're writing something fictional that's set in the real world, you're going to have a lot more real with a mm -hmm. little less strange. But there still is like this fine line you have to walk. And with um, with sci-fi and fantasy, story. if you... What? And it's different for every story. Yes. But in sci-fi and fantasy, if you don't have anything that ties it to this real life, if you don't have anything that feels real or everyday or familiar i think mm -hmm. that's what he says the familiar with the yeah. strange yeah so if you don't have anything like that like if your characters if if they have a different culture than the cultures we're familiar with here do they have behavior patterns they're familiar with mm -hmm. or do you familiarize your audience with their behavior patterns before you show them in the story you right. know i think those things are really essential mm -hmm. for yeah. writing stuff like that all right, our final trope. Let's wrap this up before our technology decides that we're done and just boots us off. Uh, finally, forbidden love. Uh, the old Romeo and Juliet. This is one of your favorite Romeo. memory serves. <laughs> yes, I love forbidden love. I love them from being from different worlds or having um, some sort of reason why they should not be together. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just feel like it's too frequent where the the obstacles to their love are their relationship itself. And a lot of times the relationship is very dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. um, 
I love the forbidden love as a barrier. So that's because all the what, problems are external rather than internal. Yes. Yeah. I actually talked to a romance author who said she absolutely never does relationship barriers. Every single book she writes, the barriers are um, the natural world or other people or the forbidden love, stuff like that, because mm. she finds it obnoxious the other way. I thought that was really mm. interesting. I personally, I like a mix of the two, but, yeah. um, but I love the forbidden love. I love that that to be the obstacle they have to overcome. I guess for me, I'm, I'm a little more meh about this trope. Like I'll, I'll read mm. it there, but I don't seek it out. Um, I guess it depends on why is it forbidden? Like if it's because mm -hmm. you know their their two countries or their two houses or whatever have been at war for a hundred years, that makes sense. Um, and then it can translate into this really beautiful story about love conquering all and blah blah blah. Um, <laughs> all that beautiful um, stuff. <laughs> yeah, but if it's just something like you know, oh my dad doesn't like your mother's brother's housekeeper or something ri like utterly ridiculous or like you know like or my grandmother the the matriarch of the family is is racist and you're a person of color first of all ditch your grandma um ditch your grandma. i didn't i didn't know you could do that racist. i didn't know that was a thing sorry grams <laughs> good to know i'm gonna remember that for later when yeah. my grandma really makes me mad yeah. i can ditch you <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, if, if it's a stupid reason or like a, or a silly reason or like this shouldn't be, it shouldn't really be a problem. Like, I don't, I don't know. I guess, I guess it, it depends on the book and it depends on the story for me. Um, yeah. And that's fine. That's true with a lot of tropes, honestly. Depend yeah, well, that's why, that's why sometimes they're done well and sometimes they are not so done yeah. well. Speaking of, you know, I, sorry, I will say, um, like you said, you have, uh, you forgive poorly written trope, ro tropic, trope, tropic, trope not necessarily tropic. poorly written, but like overused. Okay, uh, tropey books. <laughs> <laughs> if they're if they're LGBTQ, yeah. I forgive poorly written stories if they're very very humorous. So oh. I have this one author that I keep coming back to. <laughs> Everything she's written is so cliche. I mean, just the very beginning of the book, you know exactly what's going to happen in the very end of the book. Um, and I mean, you just, you're just along for the ride because she's so witty along the book that, that who cares? Just read it anyway. It's funny. My kids are like, how many times have you read that book? <laughs> At least 20. I don't know. A lot. I just think she's really funny. So that's my, that's my kryptonite is humor. I love humor. So. Same. Same. Um, when are some times from instances you've seen where forbidden love is handled poorly? Um, I think I agree with you. I think when the reasons aren't, when they don't feel real or when they don't feel good enough or when they're, when they're like paper thin, mm -hmm. they're like, wah, wah. And uh, I don't know if I don't know if you are. Uh, my dad likes to take me to the opera a lot, uh, family tradition. Mm -hmm. And for cool. uh, they're they're either like super horrible tragedies. I, I say horrible as in sad, um, or mm -hmm. really convoluted um, comedies for the classical mm -hmm. stuff. There is no middle ground, mm -hmm. and. For the comedies ones, it's it's almost always the same. Where like you know, you got this guy and he loves this girl, but her father or her family or like whoever doesn't want her to marry this guy for whatever reason. He's poor. He's like from Italian. He's like whatever. They just don't want her. Or she's married. To, she's promised to someone else. Or he just the dad's a dick. Like whatever. And like the, and this can be like I don't want to call it suspenseful because you know how it's going to end they tell you how it's going to end in the pamphlet um but it does like mm -hmm. add a nice you know layer to that story and like these humorous obstacles where like you know he has to dress up as their servant and then he has to pretend that he's the servant who's pretending to be the teacher just to get in to talk to her and then like they have they have to it, disguises like are abound in these things and then like 
you know, if, you know, the, the dad just like, I like it when they, they get married, you know, and the dad is still pissed. <laughs> like, it's just like, mm. whatever, screw you. Um, or when, but when it's like, they'll, they'll go through all this and then like the dad will be like, well, I guess he's okay. You can marry now. It's just like, we went through all that in the last 90 minutes just for you to say that. Yes. Really? <laughs> Yes, I hate it when it's like an instant change with a personality, uh, with with their uh, loyalty, with their personality, with mm-hmm. forgiving other people, with their uh, just when they're like instant like that. Like you said, the dad mm-hmm. is like, "Yeah, it's okay." Yeah. Really? I mean, I forgive it in <laughs> operas because you don't go to the opera for the story; you go for the music. Um, but in in books or movies where I'm doing it for the story, like either give them a, a full arc where they have to like come to realize that it's their child's choice or like where it's, you know, this war, this mm-hmm. feud is ridiculous or whatever. Um, or make them a full on villain who that needs to be defeated. Yeah. I feel like sometimes writers forget to give their side characters arcs. They forget that yeah. each character that has a role in the plot needs an arc. We're going to be talking about that in the worst tropes video on Thursday. Like, just like, ugh. It matters. It's always romance, and it's always a pair of the spare situation, and that drives me up a tree. There's there's your sneak peek, guys. <laughs> Join us. Yes. So uh, the other video is going to be Thursday, mm-hmm. and I'm going to be hosting it on my channel, yep, Flash University for Authors. And – Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be Thursday, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time, so that's 6 p.m. Pacific, where you're at. Um, yeah, and it's going to be our top 10 mutually most hated romantic subplot tropes and how authors can do them right. So yes. stick around and for And I that. feel like we did a good job picking tropes that are both in romance as a sh- subgenre and romance mm-hmm. as the main genre. Which is a feat, because I stay out of the romance section. To avoid all of this, <laughs> I love cheesy romances. So oh, we're a good, right. we're a good mix That's here. That's my channel. That's it. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. We're not friends anymore. <laughs> Conversation's over. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for watching. Remember to click the subscribe button so you don't miss videos. I usually um, post every Sunday, unless someone d- convinces me otherwise to give you a bonus video on a Tuesday or a Thursday. Um, that's all I got. Cammy. any last words? That sounded no, just ominous. Thanks for having me on. And what's that? That sounded, I said last words, like I'm prepared to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Why would I rub my thumb across his throat? <laughs> if you can name that movie, I will give you the galaxy. <laughs> Two gold stars for you. Yeah, this movie ever. <laughs> It is pretty hilarious. It really is. I love that movie. Anyway, what I was going to say is thank you for having me on your channel. And that this was super fun. And I'm crazy excited for Thursday. Awesome. Everybody, bye. Bye, Cammie. Bye.